Good morning, folks. Um, I apologize for the, the slight delay getting started today, um, but uh, but I'm really uh, excited and eager to be able to gather around God's Word this morning uh, and continue our study on stewardship today. Um, I pray that the principles that we've studied up to this point have been a blessing and a help to you. Uh, as always, we're not just studying uh, scriptural principles so that we can uh, just gain more head knowledge, but so that we can make actual change and application in our lives. And uh, the Lord knows better than anybody that we need constant change and sanctification. And so uh, hopefully these are very practical and helpful. And I pray that the study this morning will be a blessing to you as well. Uh, today, uh, we're going to continue in the theme of stewardship. And as I've mentioned several times, there's a lot of different facets to this topic that maybe aren't typically covered, um, but today I want to talk to you about the topic of stewarding your thoughts, stewarding your mind. Uh, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4 for our text today, and so if you'll turn there in your Bible and get ready, uh, we'll read several verses from Philippians chapter 4 here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, for introduction, uh, I'll say that we live in a very unique era in history that literally uh, inundates us with stimulus all the time, and we're inundated with constant choices and distractions that demand our attention. Um, hopefully last week's study in uh, stewarding energy and then the week prior to that in stewarding our health helped to give some clarity in establishing priorities. Uh, but um, many people in our day and age have embraced uh, previously unknown levels of stress um, and they really struggle to cope with that, and how to manage and juggle it all. Again, hopefully some, some of the principles that we've looked at so far can help to give some guidance on that, but the reality is that we do live in very stressful days. Uh, no doubt, uh, part of the difficulty that we experience results from us filling our lives uh, to capacity and beyond um, that tends to crowd out rest and tends to crowd out relationships, and left unchecked, uh, stress and worry that almost always accompanies stress uh, can overcome our thoughts, it can rule our emotions, and it can compromise our health, and it can certainly compromise our spiritual lives. Now, uh, we often blame stress itself for the, the tension that's brought about in our minds, in our bodies, in, in our relationships, um, even though there are many stresses that we could avoid. Uh, there are a number of different people that I've known through the years that are terrible procrastinators and they may put off important assignments in college or in high school or in work and then they end up having to pull all-nighters trying to catch up on those assignments that they just simply procrastinated on. That's a lot of self-inflicted stress that's fairly unnecessary. I've known other people who are just very poor stewards of finances and because of uh, uh, uncontrolled spending. They end up having to work extra jobs beyond their, their regular full-time job to try to make enough money because they can't control their spending. And there's a lot of other examples that, that we could talk about that are really within our, our control to do something about. Uh, but what about the stresses that come into your life that you have no control over? That's really what I want to deal with and talk about uh, because you do have control over the other areas that I mentioned a moment ago. But what about when sickness comes into your family? Uh, what about when sickness comes into your community or into the world around you? That's something that we're facing and dealing with, and this is a very pertinent study uh, for many people in the issue that we're dealing with on a national and global level right now. What happens when you lose your job through no fault of your own? There are many people that have lost their jobs. We have some folks in our own church that have lost their jobs as a result of this national panic that's taking place right now. So what happens when you lose your job and you face financial disaster? And what about when you're mistreated? Uh, what about all the other uncontrollable events of your life? Well, there may be nothing that you can do to change those events, uh, but many times you can't ignore them either and they require some kind of response. And so everybody handles stress in their own way. 
Uh, but there are two basic responses to stress, just to, just to paint a broad stroke. There are negative responses that are inappropriate, and there are positive responses that we're going to talk about some today. Uh, negative responses to stress include the, uh, the all-too-common lifestyles of our frenzied society, and under a tremendous amount of stress, uh, folks will become hypercritical of others. Now, they'll bury themselves in work. They'll abuse substances. Maybe they'll abuse food and overeating. Others uh, expect sympathy. Um, and others live without any kind of balance in their lives at all. So there's a lot of different negative responses. Uh, and stepping back to look at the big picture, these responses don't provide any solutions at all. They cause more problems. They may redirect our emotions for a brief time or get our mind off of the momentary crisis, but ultimately they're going to create more problems of their own, and they rob our hearts of peace, and they rob our hearts of joy. There was a Christian doctor uh, who once shared uh, this statement. He said, the sickest people that I've ever encountered, uh, that is those who were ill not only in their bodies, but also in their emotions, were those who were harboring long-term resentment, bitterness, anger, and even hatred against another person or against God. Uh, and he continued with this statement. He said, I've found that stress levels change dramatically when a patient changes his or her perceptions. Now, that doctor, as well as many uh, medical studies, confirm what God's Word already teaches us very plainly and has taught for several thousand years, that changing our thinking is really the best cure for stress. And the best way to change our thinking uh, is to renew our thoughts with Scripture. Uh, and so stewarding our thoughts, which is our topic for today and for next week as well, is a process of learning to think biblically in stressful times. Uh, retraining our sinful negative responses through very intentional habit-forming disciplines over and over and over again until the responses just start to flow naturally out in a God-pleasing way. And so Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 states that we must be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so the answer to confronting stress and the answer to dealing with anxiety is to renew our minds. Not just to change our minds, but to renew them. Uh, long before modern science discovered that our thoughts have a direct link or tie to physical and emotional responses, God's Word provides the answer to handling stress. And it's not difficult. Uh, back in 1971, there was an advertising campaign that first introduced the, uh, the commonly known slogan. You've probably heard it before, but it said that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, now, uh, that's true. The immediate context of that slogan had to do with trying to generate fundraising efforts so that uh, um, education could be funded and young people's minds wouldn't just be left uh, uneducated. Um, but on a much more serious note, minds are also very much wasted if their energies are directed in pointless circles of fear and worry and other types of negative sinful responses. For the believer, um, what if the peace of, uh, of God or the peace that, that God offers to us is neglected? Uh, while we allow stress and worry and anxiety and fears and all those types of uh, wrong thoughts to flood our minds and just eat away uh, at our security. Well, these are things that we all have to face sooner or later. And I'm going to read this scripture here in just a moment, but we all go through seasons of trials. That's a reality. Um, on top of those trials and difficulties that we inevitably face, uh, we're also burdened down um, with uh, the weight of just simply having too much to do and too little time to do it. And so if we're not applying some of the foundational principles that we've already discussed about being wise stewards of life, uh, being wise stewards of time, and then wisely stewarding our health and our energy, then that's just going to compound the problem. So let's make sure that we take care of those first topics uh, first. And then we get on to this. So... Um, a lot of people eventually find themselves in an emergency room um, and they need uh, medical treatment because of the ravages of mishandling stress. And 
Uh, and unfortunately, many people who claim to be believers in Christ and Bible believers go through habitual cycles of, uh, of um, recognizing that they need to entrust their worries and their fears and their wrong thinking to the Lord, and then they pick those things right up again, and then they entrust them to the Lord, and they pick them up again, and it's just a constant cycle that doesn't really uh, show any type of growth. And so, uh, what do we do? Uh, well, um, the, the real prescription or medication is found in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and this is God's prescription for peace in your mind and for being a wise steward of your thoughts. So, some foundational principles today that we'll discuss, and then we'll dig into it a little bit more next week. But Philippians chapter 4, and let's look at verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And I'd ask you to join me uh, in prayer and, uh, and ask for God's blessing on our time as we study some of these scriptural principles. Our Father, we bow our hearts before you, and your word is open before us right now. And we ask that uh, that the Holy Spirit would take the truths that we study and would apply them very directly to our hearts, or that you would address specific needs that we have in our lives, uh, that you would help us to be wise stewards in these areas that we've already looked at. And as we add to that today and considering how we wisely uh, and responsibly steward our thoughts and our minds, we know that this is so very critical and it's where uh, many sins find their root if we're not wise in this. And so I pray that you would help us, help us to learn, and we ask that you would make application as you see fit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, uh, again, in this lesson and, and in the next one, Lord willing, next week, um, we're going to examine uh, a, a five-part um, or five-point prescription from the scriptures here in, in Philippians chapter 4 for peace in our minds. And so, uh, so there's uh, five ways that the Bible teaches us here that we ought to think. And the first one that I'll say is that we ought to think with praise. We ought to think with praise. Uh, even though our stress factors may be quite different now than in the first century, stress itself is nothing new. It's something that folks have dealt with for many uh, thousands of years, as long as mankind has been around. A close look at the history of the Philippian church would reveal some stress inducers that would probably lead most 21st century Americans to the brink of insanity or the brink of absolute collapse. The Christians in the church at Philippi that are being written to in our text were living their faith uh, in the midst of a Roman culture that shunned, uh, that ridiculed, that even condemned Christianity outrightly. That to be a Christ follower in the Roman society meant that you were part of a, a very hated, despised minority. Um, you were a subset of the Roman culture that was just deemed stupid or, uh, or expendable, that was often used as sport. Uh, we know from history that Roman Christians were persecuted and they were martyred by the thousands. Uh, they were imprisoned, they were crucified, they were burned alive, they were fed to wild beasts, they were made to fight in the arenas. Uh, you talk about stress, you talk about anxiety, uh, this church was well acquainted with both. And it was to this church that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Philippians, or the letter of Philippians, and he gave God's prescription for how to have joy and peace and mental uh, stability during those times of great stress and anxiety. And so even though the, uh, through, the, through the words of Philippians chapter 4 that we just read here a few moments ago, these Christians could find tremendous encouragement and help to persevere and admonish um, themselves and admonish one another with the words of God to think biblically. And so Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 gives us the first principle, which was we need to think with praise. This should be something that's, uh, that is cultivated and built into our lives if we're going to be wise stewards of our thoughts. 
Once again, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Uh, it, just in case you missed it the first time he said it. He reminds us a second time in that short verse. Now, uh, maybe, maybe you're a type of person that doesn't um, just jump right out of bed when your alarm goes off, uh, excited to conquer a new day. We've got a few folks like that around my house, and, um, and uh, you'd think that they're just the most miserable people in the world when they wake up, and it takes them a while to get going. Uh, uh, most, most people maybe need a little bit of help fueling um, their, uh, their praise thinking at the beginning of the day, or maybe at some other point during the day. Um, so, so we consider the object of praise, because that's so very critical in this. If the command in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4 was to rejoice in our circumstances, then we could reasonably use the excuse that many people employ today that I'm just not really wired that way. But the command to rejoice is not rooted in circumstances, it's rooted in the infinite goodness of the Lord himself. And we have a limitless supply of reasons to praise uh, just in the person of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And when we focus our hearts on him, then we have a perfect and unchanging object of praise all the time. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 21 says that he, speaking of the Lord, he is thy praise. And he is thy God that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Now, uh, many people rejoice when they get a raise in their job at work. Uh, many people rejoice when they develop a new relationship. Many people rejoice when they acquire a new toy, um, a new snowmobile, a new uh, four-wheeler, a new truck, uh, some other type of tangible physical object. Uh, some people rejoice when they find a fulfilling hobby to invest their time in. But, uh, but it's important for us to know as Christians and as Bible believers that joy is not an emotional response to circumstances. It's far better than that. It's far deeper than that. Uh, joy is the heart's response when we choose to obey God's command to rejoice in Him. He is the object of our praise. And so, um, thinking with praise really boils down to your relationship with God. It boils down to your fellowship with Him. Your ability to praise in any circumstance, at any time, day or night, is directly hinged not on your temperament, not on your circumstances, but on your belief of who God really is. The deeper your fellowship with God is, and the fuller your understanding of who God is, the more reasons you always have to rejoice in Him. And so we praise God, not because everything is going well for us, but because He's God, and because He's good. Uh, we rejoice in the Lord. So as we talk about, first of all, um, having a, a heart or thoughts that are, that are filled with praise, and we understand the object of our praise. And then secondly, I'll mention to you the opportunity of praise. Now, most of us would do okay with the command to rejoice in the Lord if we could just pick and choose which days to do it or which times of the day to do it. Uh, but there's that one meddlesome, problematic word in this command that, that just totally eliminates that choice. And it's, it is this word, always. Rejoice in the Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice. Even on our worst days, even when we get bad news, uh, even when the car won't start, even when the kids are testing our very last shred of patience, even when we get a bad report from the doctor, even when we have um, more, uh, more month left over than we have money in our bank account, always rejoice in the Lord, always. You know, the apostles knew how to rejoice in the Lord always, even when they were beaten for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, we probably all agree that an unjust beating uh, makes for a pretty bad day, pretty bad circumstances. It's the sort of day in which most of us would feel pretty justified indulging in self-pity in our thoughts. The apostles were ordinary men just like us. Now, they felt the pain of every single stripe that was laid on them. They felt the humiliation of being unjustly accused and mistreated. Now, they felt the severity of their situation for sure. Uh, 
and yet the Bible tells us that they rejoiced. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 41, it says they departed from the presence of the Jewish council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And so we ask the question, well, how could they respond this way? The apostles carried such a high view of Jesus Christ that they rejoiced in anything that was attached to his name, even if it was a beating um, for his sake. The Psalms are filled with praise. Uh, they're not filled with the praises of a man who had absolutely no problems, but they're filled with the praises of a man who knew the Lord very, very well and found in him a tremendous reason for triumphant praise. Uh, David penned from a, a heart of joyful experience these words in Psalm 28 and verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. And so rejoicing in the Lord is the right choice, not only because God commanded it, because uh, also it's very good for us. Uh, one doctor said this, uh, anxiety and laughter cannot coexist at the same time. And so as believers, we always have reason to rejoice. And that reason is Jesus Christ himself. And when we choose to rejoice, we're choosing a biblical plan for relief from stress. And we're not talking about silliness or giddiness here. We're not talking about immaturity, but rejoicing in the right object in the Lord and doing that always. And that keeps us above the circumstances that we may encounter. The second point that I want to share, and I told you there's five points. So we cover two today, and then we'll look at the last three next week. As we talk about stewarding our thoughts, number one, we need to think with praise. Number two, from Philippians chapter four, we need to think with poise. Think with poise. It'd be hard enough to think with praise um, if the only opponent or the only difficulty that we face was just difficult circumstances. But the truth is we have, as believers, a very real and active enemy who constantly is working to undermine our hope in the Lord. He's always seeking to undermine uh, our ability to properly steward our thoughts because that's really the seed of our emotions and where everything else is going to flow out from. If we can't think properly or if we choose not to think properly, then our emotions are going to be impacted and ultimately our outward actions as well. Satan himself is a master at planting thoughts in our minds that, uh, that accuse us, um, he, he's an expert at suggesting that we're losers. Um, uh, he's an expert at, at uh, suggesting that our lives are just full of negatives all the time. And some people just frankly succumb to that and think that way all the time because their heart isn't filled with praise as we started out in the first principle. But Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 speaks of our adversary. And it says, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, truthfully, uh, that is, uh, that's an event that's going to happen yet in the future. And, uh, and right now, we can fully expect, based on what the scripture says, that Satan is constantly before the throne of God, accusing God's children and, um, and so his self-determined role is the accuser of the brethren. He makes it his business to do everything he can to steal our joy, to magnify our stress, and magnify our anxiety. Um, so what's the answer we have to ask to the bombardment of Satan? Well, it's to think with moderation, to think with poise. Uh, moderation is the word that's used in Scripture here in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, the word moderation is translated from a Greek, Greek word that means uh, suitable or equitable or just. Uh, it's it's uh, fair or gentle or mild. All those different words are translated into the English from the Greek word that we get this word moderation from. And so, um, how about you? Have you ever known somebody who seems to just never get ruffled no matter what's thrown at them? Who, even in mounting pressure, just is able to maintain a sweet disposition all the time. That's a picture of moderation if you know someone like that. 
God willing, uh, you're like that, or you're seeking to develop that type of moderation in your life. But, uh, but this type of moderation, it's a reasonableness that maintains contentment and joy regardless of circumstances that are faced. That's what God wants to see out of his people that are thinking properly. Uh, now, most of us are never really content in just God alone. And I'm just speaking uh, from, from my experience. I certainly experienced this myself, but we worry about our accomplishments. Uh, we worry about other people's perceptions of us. We worry about our reputations. Now, our minds are consumed with uh, Satan's bombardment and with anxiety. And, and uh, due to inappropriate thinking, our minds are often filled with our own insecurity and lack of confidence in the Lord. Uh, A.W. Tozer uh, said this. He said that the heart's fierce effort to protect itself from every slight to shield its touchy honor from the bad opinion of friend and enemy will never let the mind have rest. When stress begins to mount, internally and maybe through outward circumstances, God wants his people to find our contentment in him. Um, just like a, a little child, a frightened child, uh, who finds rest when daddy or mommy is near, the Bible reminds us here, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. It's not talking about his imminent return in the context. It's talking about his literal presence with us during these times when we ought to be dwelling on him, thinking on him, praising him, maintaining poise, maintaining discipline in our lives. And so as, uh, as I give you just a couple of quick thoughts on what it is to think with poise, or to think with moderation, as the Bible puts it. I'd say that, uh, that in that, you need to make sure that you rest in his security. Um, poise or moderation is not something that can be rushed. It's only acquired as we take time to wait on God. And this is something that is so difficult and so challenging for people in our fast-paced, busy society today. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. As we spend time in God's presence, uh, His peace very naturally reflects itself into our souls and really brings us tremendous security and confidence that He is at our side, that the Lord is at hand. Psalm 56 and verse 9 uh, the psalmist said, when I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. And say that waiting on the Lord calms our spirits. It helps us to gain the right perspective of our circumstances in relation to our position in Christ. And of course, we're studying through Hebrews on Sunday mornings in our main preaching service. But Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6 speak of this. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. In our frantic schedules, in our fast-paced society, uh, driven by the, the idolatry of accomplishments and building reputations, um, again, speaking for myself and something I've experienced, we tend to, to fear and resist the concept of rest, of just being still. But, uh, but I've learned this, that waiting time is never wasted time. When we're waiting on the right things, when we're wait, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord renews our souls. It refocuses our energies toward investing in what really matters. And uh, so for many people that have a bent towards drivenness and accomplishment, and, and folks that often thrive on adrenaline and that type of busyness, uh, they, they think rapidly and constantly and on multiple tracks at the same time. And, and sometimes they're going uh, multiple different ways at the same time in their efforts. And, uh, and they like to focus on progress and they like to focus on achievement. Uh, and, and sometimes they just rather spin their wheels than stand still. Uh, not long ago, I was... I was driving down the road out here, um, not far from my house, and uh, and it was the middle of the night as I was working, and there was a, a vehicle that was parked in an intersection. It was in a really odd location. It was parked um, perpendicular across a roadway, blocking both lanes of travel, and it was just sitting in the middle of the intersection, and 
Um, there was no snow on the road. It was just hard packed snow and ice. And so didn't look like it was stuck in anything, but there was a lady that was sitting there and she didn't know how to drive on the ice and she was just spinning her tires and just, uh, just sitting there in kind of a panic state, not knowing what to do. She had tried to turn around in the road and got one tire stuck in just a little tiny dip in the road that's very, very easy to get out of. And she just spun her tires until she dug a little trench and she was just stuck and couldn't go anywhere at all. Um, and I helped to pull her out really easily when I gave her some instruction on how to, uh, on how to turn her wheels the right way and, and stop spinning her wheels, but make sure that she gained some traction. And, and I just find that as a very fitting analogy for what uh, for what I've been guilty of doing in the past and many people in our busy culture do where they're, they would just rather spin their wheels so they feel like they're doing something than just being still and resting in the Lord's security. And so uh, a very important thing for us to learn. <clears throat> a second thing that we need to remember here as I wind this down is that as we talk about maintaining poise in our thoughts, uh, stewarding our thoughts in that way, maintaining, uh, uh, what did he say, moderation, we need, to rest, uh, we need to rest in the Lord, right? Rest in his security, and then we need to rest in his sovereignty. Rest in his sovereignty. Uh, if you look at the Old Testament example of Job, uh, Job was a man who knew a level of pain that very few of us will ever experience God willing. Even a quick read of just the first couple of chapters of Job um, reveals that uh, Job was a man who was hurting. Job was a man who was confused. Uh, the tragedies that he had experienced had jarred his beliefs about God, had jarred his beliefs about God's justice. He really wanted to know why his life had unraveled. Why had he lost everything, all of his finances, all of his family, his children, his friends, uh, he wanted to know, um, he just wanted to, he wanted to hear from the Lord. He, he was desperate for an opportunity to hear from God and get some answers. But through all the fog and the confusion that he experienced and really the darkness and despair that you see Job going into in, um, in the book of Job in the Old Testament, Job found tremendous peace in remembering God's sovereignty or his rule over this universe and his ultimate control. In Job chapter 23 and verse 10, he makes a phenomenal statement and says of the Lord, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job really found rest in remembering uh, that God was in control. God was allowing this, and God knew some things that Job didn't know. And he was okay with just clinging to God's goodness. It was really just raw faith when it came down to it, um, holding on to the goodness of God, even when every outward indicator denied that. Uh, his friends that came and tried to give him counsel said, God is judging you. Um, and they tried, to, uh, they tried to figure out and give some counsel to Job in this way. It ended up being very bad counsel. But when your thoughts are flooded with confusion, uh, and the trials are mounting and there's difficulties that may be surrounding you, remember that you can walk through your trials with tremendous poise because God is sovereign. God is ultimately in control. He sees you. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows about all your needs and he's in control. Um, there is, however, a caveat to finding poise in God's sovereignty, and that is a rock-solid belief that God is good. And Job understood that, and that was why Job could depend on that. Now, if you believe that God is good, ultimately, and that he's loving, um, his sovereignty can really bring tremendous comfort to your soul. But if you doubt God's motives, if you doubt his, wis his wisdom or question his wisdom, then you'll really miss out on the security that's found in his sovereignty. Uh, Margaret Clarkson may not be a name that you're familiar with, but she was a, a famous hymn writer and uh, she wrote some of the songs that, that we really enjoy, uh, More Love to Thee, O Christ. And she wrote the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Uh, several very, uh, very powerful songs on missions as well. Well, she was a woman who, uh, who had firsthand experience with intense personal pain. She, um, she dealt with debilitating um, disability and pain for much of her life and went through many different operations to help deal with that. 
Um, she experienced tremendous loneliness in her life, but she wrote these words. The sovereignty of God is the one impregnable rock to which the suffering human heart must cling. The circumstances surrounding our lives are no accident. They may be the work of evil, but that evil is still held firmly within the mighty hand of our sovereign God. All evil is still subject to him, and evil cannot touch his children unless he permits it. God is the Lord of human history, and he is the Lord of the personal history of every member of his redeemed family. And so, as we talk about stewarding our thoughts, we're considering first the principle of thinking with praise, secondly, thinking with poise, and we're taking those statements right from Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5. And so how do we find this mental poise? Well, we pause to rest in the sovereignty of God, uh, who doeth all things well, according to the scriptures. Uh, waiting on God brings stability. It brings perspective to our world. It recalibrates our hearts to focus on what's eternal. It calms our minds with the poise or with the moderation or control that can only come by realizing uh, that statement in verse 5, the Lord is at hand. He's by our side. Next week's study, um, we're going to look at the, the final three components of God's prescription for peace in our thoughts or for properly stewarding our thoughts. And so, uh, so I'll leave you with one final quick reminder as we think about God's prescription here for how our thoughts are to be managed and controlled and really for how all of our lives are to be properly stewarded. And that's this, that medicine only works if you take it. And so as we go through these studies, my challenge to you is to not just let this be some trinket knowledge that goes in one ear and out the other, but let's really eagerly look for opportunities to make application and let the Lord make some real important changes in our lives so we might bring glory to Him. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Lord bless you. And, uh, and we'll be back on here in about 20 minutes for our, our main preaching service.